welcome back to the Offspring Magazine podcast. I'll be hosting today's podcast together with Nico. We will be talking to Dr. Jean-Francois Sassi, who is an expert in the field of algae technologies and processes. We will be talking to him about the use of algae in research, specifically on their use in bioplastics. We will be learning what an algae is, how it's used in research, and how it is being used in the field of bioplastics. We are really excited that Jean-Francois is joining us today, so let's just jump straight into it. for coming. Our guest today will be Jean-Francis Sassi. I've definitely mispronounced that, but I will just give you uh, the chance and opportunity to introduce yourself now. Yeah, actually, uh, no problem, Beatrice. It's quite difficult to pronounce. So my name is Jean-Francois Sassi from CEA in France, and I am a researcher in uh, algae science. Maybe can you tell us a bit about your uh, background, like your career so far and how you get, got to the position you're in now? Yeah, sure. So I, I am a chemist by uh, education. I first uh, studied uh, organic chemistry and then I did a PhD with uh, the industry. So it was already a matter of working with natural products. So I started uh, as a PhD student with the industry, and then I worked for 10 years in the chemical industry, mainly in the field of polymers. So both synthetic polymers and natural polymers. And actually this first topic brought me to uh, all the things related to plant science, because biopolymers come from plants. And from plants, I started studying seaweeds, This is where I moved from the chemical industry to a technical research center, which is in the seashore in the northwest part of France in Brittany, where I spent seven years working in uh, seaweed science and applied research related to seaweed. And then I moved uh, seven years ago to my uh, uh, position of today, which is at CIE, which stands for the Atomic Energy and Alternative Energy Commission in France. So that may sound very far from seaweed and algae science, but actually CEA is very diverse and there is also strong science and strong research in biology. And uh, part of the biology work at CEA is related to microalgae, cyanobacteria, everything related to photosynthetic microorganisms. So at CEA, I'm responsible for a research group and also a technical platform, which is devoted to applied science, meaning assisting the industry with a real concrete development questions, meaning that we are not only involved in science, but we have also involved in the real life, developing processes and products that finally end up on the market. Yeah, so CEA sounds really interesting. Can you tell us a bit more about um, about what they do or what, what you all do there? Actually, somehow CEA is very similar to the German Fraunhofer, for instance. Uh, CEA is an RTO. It's a research and transfer organization. So it, it works in between science and industry. So the main idea is to... Uh, increase what uh, we call the technology readiness level of research in order to push it to the market and to push it to the industry. So CEA hires 25,000 people in France, divided into 16 research facilities, small and big ones. And I belong to a regional transfer center which is located in the south of France, close to Marseille and Aix-en-Provence. Uh, and actually, this is a region where there are a lot of uh, companies and small industries, but also large industries who are growing 
microalgae for different purposes. For instance, we have a strong industry in the south of France for growing spirulina, which is a, a health complement. It's a nutraceutical, uh, which is uh, known by people who know the, 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 the best uh, things that are found in spirulina. So if you consider complementing with uh, iron and proteins and this type of things, uh, the, 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 the food that you take, you should eat spirulina, which is very good for health. Okay, so you were already getting a bit into the technical details. So before uh, we maybe talk about uh, more detail in, uh, about your research, could you maybe first define like what actually uh, what algae you're working with um, and what exactly they are? So we in my group we work on microalgae, which are single cell organisms that uh, are able to make photosynthesis, meaning that they use the light, either from the sun or artificial light. They use CO2, either from the atmosphere or from compressed tanks. And they use uh, mineral nutrients. So it can be a source of nitrogen, such as uh, ammonium or nitrate. It can be a source also of phosphate. And altogether, they are able to produce biomass without any input from any organic material. So we work on different species of microalgae. Uh, actually, the, the first uh, topic that we, we consider is the potential application of the biomass that we grow, meaning that the Uh, the first request comes from the market, from the partners who want to get a specific property. So it can be bioactivity, it can be texture, it can be different things. Uh, they want to make materials, for instance. And uh, you have to translate their request into chemical molecules. And from these chemical molecules, you have to consider the, metabol the metabolisms of algae and the biochemical ability to produce the molecules of interest so that gives you uh, uh, potential candidates for a species of algae and then you have to consider which are the best which are the the most easy to domesticate the most easy to grow and process also the ones that are allowed and on given markets, because there are also regulations for if you consider food, cosmetics application, there are regulations. And all this together, you end up with a specific type of algae that is the best candidate. So we don't have any favorite algae. It's only a matter of the question that is raised at the beginning of the story, saying somebody comes and say, I want to replace this in my product, or I want to get this specific property, I want to cure cancer, I want eternal life, everything, you see? And sometimes you say, no, eternal life is not possible. <laughs> you work with microalgae. So my first question for that would be, you said that microalgae are single cellular. Are there different types of algae that are usually multicellular or are all unicellular? Yeah, actually, microalgae can be also associated together. So if you consider, for instance, filamentous algae, uh, these are a few cells that are stuck together. Uh, spirulina, for instance, can be considered as a multicellular organism because it, it, it gives filaments at the end. And of course, there are also some macroalgae, seaweeds, that are large organisms. So they, they, here the cells are aggregated and there is a kind of specialization within the, the, what we may call the plant because they, they have um, different parts. They have a kind of leaves that you call tuli. They have also some hook to anchor on rocks. So in that, in that case, there is a kind of a differentiation in the different cells that constitute the plant. But in my group, we are only with single cell uh, algae, not seaweed, because seaweed is a different uh, class of organism. And it's also 
different class of science, meaning when you go for seaweed cultivation, for instance, you, this is more marine science. And uh, although we are not far from the Mediterranean, we are not close to the seashore. So for that, for that reason, our facility is not very well adapted to growing seaweed. And so my second actually question to what you had mentioned before was, so you use these different microalgaes to address the needs of your consumers um, for their different types of products. But how do you know that a specific um, species of algae will be good for this specific product? Yeah, this is uh, knowing the, the, the exact substance means that you, you need to have gathered some experience. So this is where this is quite interested to, interesting to have first started working with the classical chemical industry because uh, my position is today is very similar to the position I had before. Uh, I was working in corporate research in a big chemical group and, and there were different businesses involved in different fields of application. People wanted to develop cosmetics, people wanted to develop detergents, people wanted to develop plastics, materials, different types of products. And they all came to corporate research saying, can you design this type of polymer for me? So this is where you can learn to make the link between the physical chemical properties and the, the chemical structure of the molecules that you build. And then if you know a little bit about, about biology, about the way proteins, polysaccharides, and different types of polymers are made by plants, you can also make the link between the biochemical ability of living organism and uh, their capacity to produce specific type of products. But this is mainly based on experience and uh, I would say talking to people in different fields. You have to talk to people who are on the business side and uh, you have to translate their questions, their requests into, let's say, science between brackets, because this is not real science. It's uh, mainly a matter of um, association and association of ideas. Uh, if you consider cooking, for instance, it's the same. You know that if you, if you want to make an emulsion, if you want to make mayonnaise, you need fat, you need water, and you need to stir it. This is where chemistry starts. And this is where also cosmetic formulation starts. So you can be very well educated into chemistry, but you have to know also practically the way the things can be assembled in order to develop products. And this is where you can start talking to other people who work in different fields of science and even in different fields of uh, industry, not only science, but also marketing, business development, this type of thing. Okay, so actually, uh, so let's imagine, like someone comes to you and asks, okay, I want to have like a polymer with this uh, characteristics. How do you then start the production? Um, like, do you, do you first uh, start talking to research groups that maybe uh, have a connection to, to a polymer in this kind and then you ramp up the production? Because I imagine you can't just say, okay, here's a bioreactor, we immediately start there and then produce it within a month or so. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm, I'm able to make the first link and the first translation and then go to the experts or do it by ourselves. It depends. We can do in-house development or if we need, uh, for instance, specific knowledge and specific uh, competencies and skills in biology, for instance. And uh, we, we go to another lab, which can be internal or it can be external. We have also many external collaborations. And uh, actually, we go to, to pick the seeds because when you grow algae, you need the first cell, okay? You need the first strain. And this is where the biologists can be of great help because they, 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 they collect, they characterize, they, are even to, they have even tools to modify also the strains in order to increase their metabolic ability to produce the given compounds. So this is where we start collaboration with, I would say, real scientists and real researchers who are more in the lab. 
And then we take the seeds, we take the strains, and we develop the process in order to grow it in adequate quantities. So it can be big quantities, it can, it can be small quantities, but under very contained environment, because we need something very controlled, depends. So for that purpose, we have different tools. Uh, and uh, or for instance, our systems that are used to grow microalgae are called photobioreactors. Photo because we use light, bio because there is a biological thing ongoing in the reactor and of course the reactor because there are some biochemical reactions going on. So these photobioreactors can be different types, different geometries, uh, different costs also depending on the, on the application. So there are different levels of uh, sophistication in technology and you can do things very simple just like growing grass in the garden but you can, can do things also very controlled and monitored real biotech work actually so everything is possible you you can consider extensive six system for instance if you want to 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 couple the production of algae with the treatment of effluents because algae are able to grow for instance on wastewaters they are also able to grow on exhaust gases from the industries or from biological processes. So you can also develop very clever systems, ecological, in, uh, industrial ecology, sorry, in order to, to take benefit from specific opportunities. So it can be either extensive or it can be very technological especially if you consider the cosmetic industry, for instance. The, the, the quantity of algae that are produced for the cosmetic industry are very small, but they are very precious and they are expensive. They make the, the whole value of the cosmetic product. This is what is written in big capital letter on the label. This cream contains blue microalgae, for instance, uh, and this is make the, 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 what makes the, the value of the product. So in, in that case, you need uh, very contained systems. You need to control the growth. You need to control also the, the, the production of the active molecules in order to certify that the content and the activity will be the same for every batch. So there are many scenarios depending on the field of the industry that you address. So can you give us a number on how much algae you produce? Ah, actually we are not producers. So that's a difficult question because we are researchers. So we do apply research, so, but we produce algae depending on research projects. So, so the first steps will be, for instance, lab scale experiments. And in that case, the quantities that are produced are minimal. And then sometimes people ask us to produce the first prototypes, the first batches, the first kilos of biomass. And in that case, we will produce about one kilo per week, not more, because we have small systems. We have pilot scale systems. And we, if we want to increase the production, this is where we need to transfer the knowledge to real producers, real industrial players. So it can be industrial players, but it can be also some kind of farmers who know how to grow algae. So there are different scenarios. You go to a plant or you go to a field and uh, the, this guy will produce. And, and in that case, the, the production capacity for microalgae, uh, if you consider the surface which is used to grow the uh, microalgae, usually it's uh, between 10 and 50 tons per hectare and per year. So this is quite a highly productive crop compared to the regular plants or trees that grow on Earth. You did mention that it was a highly productive plant. so to make all these different products, the uses that you use algae for, 
do you, would you say that you need small amounts of algae or would you say it's not a very you need large amounts and then a lot goes into the waste actually it's a uh... The algae are very productive, but this is still considered as a promising potential. Okay, so far the 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 the, the total amount of microalgae that is produced in the world is not very big. It's uh, tens of thousands of tons, not more. So if you compare to other crops, and even if you compare to marine to seaweeds, for instance, it's very minimal. Meaning that so far microalgae are confined to uh, small markets, high value market, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, a little bit of uh, f- feed for juveniles in aquaculture. So these are minute quantities that are produced. But there is a strong potential to increase this capacity and to address other fields of markets, meaning moving to from high value specialties to low value specialties and finally to commodities. And this is where, for instance, there is a lot of interest with respect to developing algae as an alternative raw material, an alternative biomass for biofuels, for chemicals. But the, the gap is very big between the actual, the existing state of the industry and what could be the future state of the industry. Uh, there are several orders of magnitude. So, so you cannot do the jump like this. You, know? you have to increase gradually and you have to find intermediate markets that will allow to build industry, that will allow also to test technologies and to develop alternative technologies for a more efficient and a less costly production of microalgae. And this is where actually all our research devoted to bio-based chemistry, bio-based materials, bioplastics is. It's between high value things, nutraceuticals and cosmetics and commodities, biofuels and uh, chemical intermediates. So this is the reason why at CEA we, we decided to develop this specific field of application, which is actually a new field of application for microalgae. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the use of algae in bioplastics. But maybe before we get into that, can you um, first define what a bioplastic is so that everyone's on the same page? Ah, So I have to to be cautious about the definition because there there are several definitions for bioplastics. Uh, The usual understanding is that uh, everything which is uh, bio-based can be considered as a bioplastic meaning there is no specific need, for instance, to be biodegradable, to be considered as a bioplastic. Uh, For instance, polyethylene, PE, can be produced from sugars. Uh, This is done in big quantities in in South America, in Brazil. You start with sugar coming from sugarcane, and then you produce ethylene out of it, and then polyethylene out of it. A company called Braskem does this, for instance. And this polyethylene can be considered as a bioplastic because it starts from a bioresource. Um, the, the other understanding of the, of the term bioplastic means also something which is bio-based, but which is also biodegradable. So it can be either a natural polymer or it can be something that is produced either chemically or by living organisms, which gives a biopolymer, and this biopolymer will be biodegradable. Uh, For instance, um, there is a a product which was developed by BASF, which is called Ecoflex. It's not a a real bio-based plastic in the thing that it doesn't start from uh, monomers coming from natural resources. 
but still it is biodegradable. So it is petro-based, but it is biodegradable. So you can have petro-based biodegradable that you may consider bioplastic, and you can have nature-based, not biodegradable, that you will consider bioplastic. So that's a very difficult question, actually. So the, my understanding of bio-based means that you start from natural resources and possibly you start from something that uses CO2 as a start. So the actual process of going from your starting material to the finished bioplastic, it doesn't matter. So it can be as chemical, let's put that in quotations, as we want, um, as long as either it's biodegradable or it comes from a natural source. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the process can be chemistry, it can be biology, it can be also a mixture of both. If you consider, for, there are some projects, for instance, to develop biopropylene and biopolypropylene. And in that case, it's clearly a mixture of a, uh, first producing the monomer from natural resources, so it's mainly bio-based and biological processes, and then the buildup of the polymer is real chemistry. It's uh, the usual route to polypropylene. So you can use all the tools that you 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 need actually, and uh, uh, use them in the most efficient manner. And usually it's sometimes it's it's really uh, beneficial to combine chemistry and biology in different steps of converting the biomass so i just wanted to ask like what kind of bioplastics uh, are you producing or were you looking in in your lab uh, so the the, the 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 main source for bioplastic currently is a carbohydrate so it can be either simple sugars or it can be carbohydrate polymers. Um, for instance, the, the 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 very the more simple bioplastics that can be considered proceed from starch. Okay, so consider potato starch, for instance. This can be plasticides. And you can produce bags, films and bags out of plasticized starch. This is the most simple. Uh, so we work on this type of solution because starch is can be produced in the microalgae in a very efficient manner. Uh, the, the other solution that we are after is producing polyesters, aliphatic polyesters. And in that case, these are uh, polymers that are produced by bacteria. But bacteria need food, okay? And they need sugars and they need also some fatty acids in order to produce the polyesters. And our scheme in that case is to grow the algal biomass, proceeding from mineral nutrients, CO2 and fertilizers, we enriched the biomass into the, the specific compounds that are needed for the bacteria. Then we feed the bacteria with the algae with the good composition. So we produce feed for bacteria and bacteria do the job for producing the polyesters. And, and they, for instance, uh, this type of bacteria are able to produce what is called polyhydroxyalkanoids. So it can be either polyhydroxybutyrate or it can be copolymers, butyrate and valerate. Uh, and these are, I would say, more advanced plastics. Where these plastics have better um, properties with respect, for instance, to packaging compared to plasticized starch. So, so we have a first solution, which is plasticized starch, and we have a second solution, which is polyesters produced from starch hydrolyzed and coming from algae. And uh, the next generation could be, for instance, to try to produce also polyolefins. So the idea would be to mimic the way biopolypropylene or biopolyethylene are currently produced from sugars. 
but instead of uh, sourcing the sugars in uh, sugar cane or in corn, we would source the sugar in in algae. And the, the, the downstream process is almost the same. I mean, you grow the, the crop, you hydrolyze the carbohydrate polymers into simple sugars, mainly glucose. Uh, so you feed the glucose syrup to specific yeast or specific bacteria or even chemical catalysts that are able to convert the sugars into the chemical monomers that are used to build up the polymer. So I had a quick question if we go back to when you said that you use the bacteria to also make polymers. Um, can Do you use genetically modified bacteria there or could you do this? Yeah, yeah ge genetic modification could be a solution, but uh, there is also a lot of natural diversity. So uh, regarding the work on bacteria, uh, we mainly collaborate with people who are expert in this field. Okay, We are only algae growers. So we can grow fatty algae, we can grow sweet algae, we can grow blue, green, red. Okay, And regarding all the work related to fermentation and transformation of its feedstock into polyesters, we rely on collaboration with other labs. And these labs are mainly involved in the, uh, selecting from the natural diversity the best candidates to produce the polyesters. So first you have to select the best, would say, candidate strain naturally. And sometimes people also try to apply some specific uh, selection pressure in order, in order to push the bacteria to produce more uh, biopolymer. So this is already very powerful. And if you want to increase more the production, in that case, you, you may use also the genetic modification tools. You can use the molecular scissors, this type of thing. And in that case, you can totally reprogram the way the microorganism will work in order to, to grow finally plastic granules and not more real living organisms. But this is quite difficult to, 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 to increase to large scale after because all this has to be very well controlled and well contained. And, and this is not in real agreement with large-scale industries. You cannot grow, for instance, uh, in big systems that would uh, be directly exposed to the natural environment. You have to be in very contained systems. So I, let's say trust the biodiversity, the natural biodiversity. Trust also the ability of the natural diversity to answer to specific pressures and to, I would say, to, 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 to increase production by natural adaptability. This is the way the, the, the agriculture was developed, for instance. Started from very wild plants with very small organs, small seeds, and finally we end up with big uh, corn cobs for instance, but it started with something very small. Yeah, so basically that means that uh, there's already a huge diversity that can be used and it's not necessary to design new things uh, because they already exist. Um... Yeah, yeah, there are many things existing. If you, but if you want to, to transfer specific ability to cells to produce uncommon compounds, in this case, you will have to, to, to use genetic modification. If you want, for instance, to, 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 have a, a, to get a bacteria that will be able to produce directly from CO2 the, poly, the polyhydroxyalkanoids and produce it in, in large quantities in the cell, in this case, you will have to, to cut some specific 
metabolic pathways in the cells and you will have to go for genetic modification. All right. So that's part one with John and Francois. Thank you so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed it. Um, Stay tuned for the second part, which we will be releasing next week, where we will dive into more detail on specifically how algae are being used in bioplastics and how the field of bioplastics is growing. Um, It was super exciting. So in the meantime, you can follow us on the Offspring Magazine Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram accounts. And you can follow Jean-Francois Sassi on LinkedIn, where you will find him under his name, Jean-Francois Sassi. See you next time. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srina Thrankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye!